Thai forest tradition. I was actually talking a little bit about this just the other day uh, with um, Mark Allen from Sydney Uni. And uh, you, you, know, you have this, this kind of interesting phenomenon in, in modern Buddhism where uh, we have these uh, lineages or traditions, okay? So you have, a tra you have the Thai forest tradition, right? And so that's what we can see. You can go to Thai, it's actually a, a contemporary tradition and it's got its own history. We can read books by the masters and blah, blah, blah. Now uh, then we have also a very long tradition, right? Which goes back to the Buddha, the Sangha tradition as such, yeah? But what, what you were lacking, certainly in Theravada, is very much that sort of in-between, the medium tradition is actually very thin in Theravada. Uh, so, for example, in the Thai forest tradition, it's not really possible, as far as I know, in a meaningful sense, to trace that back beyond the last part of the 19th century. Okay? So, of course, there are, there are mentions of forest traditions and so on in Thailand previous to that, but we don't really know whether that actually has any particular connection with what we call the forest tradition today. It's just a word, forest tradition. What does it mean? Similarly, in, in Burma, you have the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the contemporary Burmese meditation schools, Mahasi and so on. And uh, they... Um, when apparently, I think it was Venerable Nyana Ponika, one of the very senior German monks who, I think maybe in the 1950s or something, went to uh, Burma and did meditation there. And he sort of made inquiries uh, and tried to do some research as, well, what's the history and the lineage of this teaching? And he could really only take it back a generation or two to maybe the generation of, say, Lady Sider, who was around the, the, the turn of the century. And uh, so it seems that um, there's not really any particular historical evidence for these kind of meditation lineages as being much older than that. And in fact, it's quite possible, and as I was discussing with, with Mark, is that, that, that the reason there's no evidence for them is because there weren't any. And, because, and the, the, the modern meditation movements, uh, in fact, stem largely from the uh, uh, modernist reforms in Buddhism that happened around the middle of the 19th century, and so which is actually a post-colonial movement. So with the, the colonial movement, you have this thing what they call Protestant Buddhism, which basically means go back and read the, the original texts, okay? Uh, just as the, the, the Protestant movement in Europe said, well, let's go back and read the Bible and not necessarily believe what the church is telling us, yeah? And so what they call Protestant Buddhism, it's a bit of a slogan in academic circles. It says, well, let's not look at what Buddhism is, but let's look at what the Buddhist texts say, the original Buddhist texts in the Pali Canon. Read them. They tell you how to meditate, that you should be meditating and how to meditate. Let's go and do that. Yeah? And so it seems to me that it's fairly likely that actually the modern meditation traditions really stem from, uh, or largely at least, from uh, that kind of process rather than from a, a necessarily a, a sort of an ancient continual meditation lineage. Which is not to say that there's not a that there wasn't a lineage and that that didn't have influence, but I think that the uh, the very large part of the influence is like a modern reform movement. Now in Thailand, what happened was that uh, in the middle of the 19th century, you had the reforms introduced by uh, Prince Mongkut. Yeah, so you probably know Prince Mongkut from The King and I. Yeah, Yul Brenner in The King and I. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And he, um, he before he was a, became king, he was a monk. And uh, he wrote some very interesting books, actually, and did some very interesting research. And his biography is quite, uh, uh, quite interesting, quite inspiring. But he, he uh, essentially ordained as a young man, he was obviously very brilliant, had a very brilliant mind, uh, and very, uh, a very critical mind, and a very uh, incisive kind of uh, thinker. But he ordained, and after his first ordained, he went to practice at this meditation monastery outside of Bangkok. 
and uh, they said, do this, do that, this is how you meditate. And when he asked them questions, why do you do it like this, what is this, they couldn't answer his questions. Okay? And he became very disillusioned because he felt that they were just sort of doing things by rote, just sort of, just this just, just this mechanical process. There didn't seem to be any depth of, of actual authenticity or experience in what he, he found. So he left that place, came back to Bangkok and, and sort of went on a, an exploration of the Pali texts and became a, a very good Pali scholar. Uh, and so that was his, and, and on that basis formed the, the kind of the modern structure of the Thai Sangha. And then in the next generation after uh, him, uh, came along a fellow called Ajahn Man. Uh, Ajahn Man uh, hailed from Uban Ratchatani in the northeast of Thailand. He was born, I think, 1890 or something like that, or oh, in the 1890s. Uh, and of course, in those days, the northeast Thailand region was very, very poor, uh, very backwards and undeveloped. Uh, and yeah, still, still very primitive and simple villages in that area. If you're interested in to look at the the um, a depiction of that region in those times, there's actually one of the most an interesting cultural artifact from that region is a film called Chang, Chang being the local word for elephant, and this black and white. Um, silent film made in the 1920s by the fellow who then went on to make the first King Kong. I can't remember his name, but the director of King Kong, before that, made a, a, a movie called Chang, set in northeast Thailand, about the northeast Thailand villages. Yeah? And a similar kind of theme about the kind of the monster from the forest who was threatening the, uh, the fragile settlements and how they had to defend themselves against the threats from the jungle. So, uh, but that gives you an idea of how um, tenuous life was in those days. So Ajahn Man <coughs> um, had a friend whose name was Upali. Now Upali, uh, uh, there's, there's various kinds of stories of their adventures when they were young and so on. Ajahn Man was a uh, uh, expert in what they call more lum. Um, but this is before he was Ajahn Man, when he was just a, a kid, Man, and Mor Lam. And Mor Lam is the local form of um, folk music. And it's like a kind of, um, it's a kind of, it's a bit like a kind of an old blues thing or something. But it's, it's, it has a, it's, it has like a, a, a rhythmic kind of beat and then improvised dialogue over the rhythm. And typically the, the improvised dialogue would be a man and a woman. So you'd have this kind of whole backing and forthing thing going on and they would use lots of poetry and plays with words and innuendos and all of these kinds of things. So it was a very popular art form in those days, a folk art form, and Ajahn Man was very clever with that. He's very, very sharp mind and very good with words and uh, so on. So he used to, uh, it was one of the things he used to do. So he uh, ordained and like um, men, most most men uh, in Thailand in those days would take temporary ordination. Of course, uh, opportunities for ordination for women were uh, slender or non-existent. Um, he ordained um, in uh, some local village monastery, I think. Now, uh, um, it's been a long time since I've brushed up on all the details of these things, but um, after a few, he came in contact with. Uh, some meditation monks and became more interested in the meditation side of things, the meditation aspect, and wanted to travel around and do that. He switched, after his, after his ordination, he switched his ordination lineage to what they call the Dhammayu sect. So uh, in Thailand, what was forming in those decades, or had probably had already formed, was an idea of having two separate Nikayas, what they call the Mahanikaya and the Dhammayu. Dhammayu was the, f the reform sect originated by Prince Mongkut, okay, based on a Burmese ordination lineage. Right? And it was and remains a very small minority. About 5% of Thai monks are in the Dhammayut Nikaya. Uh, the Dhammayut Nikaya, you know, for those of us in Australia, what happened 
is that the Thai, they sat down, the two sects sat down, and they apparently they, car they drew, got a map of the world and, and appointed one or other of the sect to each country, and Australia got Dhamma Ute, right? So the, the local Thai monks who you see in Sydney are Dhamma Ute monks, okay? So they're from that reform sect. The Jaokun Samai and the Annandale Temple and these places is from a Dhamma Ute. Uh, it's predominantly in Australia. Uh, the rest of Thailand, the rest of Thai Sangha is what they call Mahanikai. Now Mahanikai really is not a, 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 a sect as such, but it's really just what's left over. And they didn't really have a sense of being a unified sect or, 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 or grouping, except it formed in opposition or in contrast to the Dhamma Yut. Yeah? So that's about 90 or 95 percent of the monks in Thailand. So typically, uh, the idea was that the, the Mahanikai monks were slack, okay? So we've just been reading the article just now about wearing lipstick and carrying handbags and these kinds of things. So they would be, that's the Mahanikai kind of style, yeah? <laughs> not so hung up, you know, not so uptight about things, you know, a little bit of a, wearing a handbag is not such a problem. <laughs> uh, bit of lipstick, never mind. So that's the kind of the... The Mahanikai was much more uh, culturally based. They would do things like, uh, like, like kind of the rituals and ceremonies for the villagers. They would do lots of kind of Brahmanical style rituals. They would do things like um, they would give, say, very colourful sermons in local dialects and so on. So that would be almost like uh, like I mentioned, Ajahn Mun was doing the more lum folk style singing. So they would do stuff like that and they would tell the ancient stories in a very dramatic style where they'd kind of imitate all the voices of the characters and these kinds of things. So they'd be like, almost like putting on plays for people. These kind of folk arts and traditions which were, which, which were carried out in the monasteries around Thailand. The Dhamma Yut sect was much more serious, right? And they're, they're Pali Canon, Four Noble Truths, Keeping Vinaya, yeah? And it was all a bit more kind of serious and stern. It was also mixed up with the whole notion of the creation of Thailand as a nation state in, uh, in, 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 in the colonial era. Yeah? So ensuring the stability and coherence of the Thai nation state under threat from colonial powers. So the Dhamma Yut movement was a, trying to unify nationalist movement to try to unify Thailand. So typically what happened is that a lot of the, the monks in the forest tradition, including Ajahn Man, Ajahn Chah, and many others, they would just ordain in their local village temple, which would usually be a Mahanikai temple. Then after a while, they started to learn a bit, got a bit of knowledge. They realized they wanted to, to sharpen up their vinaya practice, get a bit more serious about things, and so they wanted to convert to Dhamma Yut. So Ajahn Man w did that. And uh, I mentioned before his friend Upali, uh, uh, went also became a monk, but Upali uh, followed a different career course, and he ended up going to Bangkok and becoming uh, a very respected academic study monk in Bangkok. And he became Jao Kun Upali, who's a very well known and very respected figure from that era. But he retained his friendship with Ajahn Man in that time. So you know, so you have, almost have these kind of two career choices as the, the forest monk or the study monk, and there's these two friends who ended up doing that. But but the, both of them as part of that Dhamma Yut movement, which was that kind of reform movement. Yeah? Now, despite the fact that Ajahn Man joined this Dhamma Yut movement, he didn't, that doesn't mean that he uh, accepted or embraced everything which they stood for. On the contrary, one of the controversial or, or uh, questionable aspects of the Dhamma Yut when it was formed was that uh, it seems that a lot of the people, including perhaps Prince Monkut himself, believed that Nibbana was unattainable in this present age. Right? That we live in a degenerate times and it's not pro possible to realize the various stages of enlightenment. Yeah? And this idea was very, very widespread. And part of the Dhamma Yut movement had been um, much more... Uh, focused on, well, we can't get enlightened, so let's uh, focus on encouraging people to do dana and keep their precepts and study the Dhamma. These are the things we can actually do. And, and really, you know, trying to meditate to get enlightened is a bit of a waste of time. 
Okay? And a lot of people believed this kind of thing and still do. So Ajahn Man, when he ordained, had been told these kinds of things and he didn't really know whether this was true or not. Okay? And this is one of the themes that comes out in his biography. And he, so he had to test that. So he joined the Dhamma Yut and you know, the, the certain aspects of that were <coughs> very supportive for him. The good Vinaya practice was supportive. The sort of the coming back to the, the central teachings, the Four Noble Truths and so on. These were all very supportive. Other things he introduced innovations like, uh, uh, say, keeping the Dutanga practices. Yeah, just wearing one set of three robes, eating one time a day, uh, eating, going for alms and just eating his alms, the food that he got in his alms bowl. These were innovations in those times. Yeah? And he would be criticized for it. Yeah? So one time he was at a, uh, uh, a big ceremony or something like that, and he was eating out of his alms bowl. And the other monks were criticizing him, saying, how can you eat out of your, your bowl? That's, that's, that's so, so uncivilized. You know, there's all these important people here. Yeah? How can you be eating out of your bowl you know, with just your fingers? And then he, he said, well, how can you eat off plates? With, with the Buddha here, and pointed to the Buddha image. Yeah? How could you sit with the Buddha watching you and then eat off a plate and not use your bowl? So this is Ajahn Man's way of practice. He's very much in the Mahakasapa school, the kind of the, the ascetic, you stern kind of thing. You see his photographs, he looks really grim in his photos. But that has to be taken also with a bit of a grain of salt because uh, at that time in Thailand, it's actually quite no you didn't smile in photographs. It wasn't the done thing. Uh, also, it was socially not yet really acceptable for monks to have their photos taken. It was a kind of a bit of a, because it was a kind of a vanity thing. So apparently he didn't really like having his photo taken. He had to be forced to do it, so he was a bit grumpy. And you also see, you also see that he, <laughs> that he, uh, he's very skinny, yeah, in the photograph. And you think, wow, he's really emaciated, yeah. But, uh, but that also, if you go to central to northeast Thailand, even today, you see, you know, the, the, the old guys there, or they're all like that. You know, I mean, they, they, the diet is just not very good. They smoke. Hajiman, I think, smoked, and uh, probably chewed betel nut, and uh, had one meal a day. So yeah, he looks pretty skinny, but he's, it's not, it's not as uh, drastic as it might appear. Yeah, it's in it's in the Vinaya, yeah. So, but but uh, so some of those things are uh, are more kind of recommended practices or extra practices. So, so for example, eating one meal a day, and the Buddha said, "Well, look, I eat one meal a day. It's good." He said, "If you want to have two meals a day, that's fine." Uh, so, but it's more like an optional extra to do the one meal a day thing. Yeah. Is this in the Vinaya that you can't smoke in the No, it's allowed to smoke in the Vinaya. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you allowed to smoke? But the question is, there wasn't any tobacco in the time of the Buddha. So then people are asking, well, what were they smoking? Yeah. And and did it and did it help their meditation? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there is a thing. It's a, it's actually it's actually it's actually it's actually part of Ayurvedic medicine that that um, certain certain herbs are smoked. Yeah. Yeah. And also remember that a hundred years ago and so on, they didn't they didn't know that there was a health risk with smoking and things like that. It was just kind of something that people all did. So he, Ajahn Man, then uh, pursued this practice, went off to the forest to try to meditate. Mm, he had uh, there was a circle of monks who would meet around and mix, and they would learn from. Uh, and one particular monk, Ajahn Kao, was so sorry, Ajahn Sao was his teacher in that period, and uh, so he learnt a lot about meditation and so on from Ajahn Sao. And uh, in that period, he he uh, sort of d discovered or developed those things which have remained very much the core practices of the forest tradition, uh, which means. Uh, and sort of the essence of the forest tradition in terms of lifestyle is keeping a very strict vineyard, uh, living in a secluded place in the forest, an emphasis on simplicity, having a simple heart or something like that. The wandering lifestyle that they call tudong, wandering from village to village. These days it's much more difficult to do because of the pace of development. You can't really wander around so much. In those days you would be wandering along a jungle track 
from one village to the next. These days it's walking along a highway in the sweltering sun with trucks thundering past you, so it's not so uh, conducive. Um, and uh, a, a focus on the uh, a simple, uh, sort of very direct uh, and authentic application of the, the core central Buddhist teachings. Okay, So not uh, so much into the whole uh, sort of scholastic philosoph philosophical side, but let's take the Four Noble Truths, let's take the Eightfold Path, Impermanent Suffering, Not Self, let's take those central teachings, apply them, and it's, it's, it's all about the, the authenticity and the, the integrity and the, the, the power with which you apply those teachings, um, which is the important thing. And the central, which is not to say that uh, Ajahn Mun and, and so on weren't kind of learned. And I, I've, I've heard that, I'm not sure how true it is, but I heard that Ajahn Man used to carry around a copy of the Abhidhamata Sangaha on his Tudong, which is a, 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 an 11th century Burmese uh, compendium of the Abhidhamma. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a slim volume. Uh, They certainly were critical of uh, Adama was critical of approaches to Dhamma that was like purely scholastic and which 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 sort of uh, didn't believe in the experiential side. But remember that um, the context that he'd come from, where people literally didn't believe. You know, I, I, it's hard to sort of get get your head around this. You know? so we, we've approached Buddhism as you know the meditation's the first thing we find about Buddhism, but that's really not how it is. Yeah, Ajahn, I've heard Ajahn Mahabua, one of Ajahn Man's students talking in his Dhamma talk, and he spent three years in Bangkok, studying in Bangkok, uh, before he went to the forest to find Ajahn Man. And while he was practicing there, he used, to, he used to study with the other monks and then go off and do his meditation. And the other monks would laugh at him. You know, they'd make fun of him. You know? Oh, boy, you're going to go off and get, go, tell us, you're going to go to Nibbana, are you? You're going to go to heaven. Oh, well, tell us what it's like when you get to Nibbana. Will you come back and let us know? And so they were, they were, they were having jokes at him. And laughing at him because he was diligent in his practice. You know that's how alienated you know, much of the sangha has become from the actual practice of meditation, and that remains the same today. So, uh, Adun Mahabua, uh, sorry, Adun Man, uh, and then developed these the central meditation practices of the the forest tradition. One is the the recollection of the word Budho. So they use Buddha as a mantra, either just using it as a, as a meditation word by itself or else connecting it with the breath. So Buddha, Buddha with the breath, or doing it while walking meditation. So that was one uh, particular meditation. Second one was uh, body investigation. So uh, in looking at the very parts of the body, looking at the elements. The Thai forest tradition is very much a, a body-based meditation system. They have very strong emphasis on mindfulness of the body. They have very cemetery contemplations. They very often would go to the cemeteries and be with decaying bodies, um, or uh, just uh, investigating <coughs> the images of their uh, their own body and so on in, in various ways. So it's a very strong part. Uh, contemplation, uh, breath meditation of anapanasati, another very strong part of the Thai forest tradition. And they also emphasize a lot on walking meditation. And uh, some of the, the Thai forest masters will, will do mostly walking meditation uh, and, and, and a fairly short amount of time sitting. Yeah? Uh, and of course, this is in addition to, the, to the, the, the wandering that they would do. So very often, you're walking for many, many hours every day. Uh, so that's a very strong emphasis. Uh, so these are the kinds of meditations which Ajahn Man was developing. Now, he had as a guide and a friend this other monk, Ajahn Sao, during this period. And, uh, uh, but there, there came a point where he actually surpassed his teacher. And there came a point where he had a, a, a nimitta or an experience in, in his meditation where he actually um, uh, real, he, he came up against a wall in his progress. He, he, his meditation become very deep, very profound, but he couldn't develop any further. And then he... Uh, realized or understood that he had made a bodhisattva vow in his past life, that he had made a vow to become a Buddha, and that because of that, that he couldn't realize enlightenment in this lifetime. You know, this was an obstruction for him. So he renounced his bodhisattva vow. Yeah? He was so de determined 
to, to realize full enlightenment in this very life, that he renounced this vow which he'd made in past lives, which was obstructing his progress. So this is also interesting. Uh, I, 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 I won't comment on that one, but uh, we wouldn't be here if you hadn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's many there's different ways of looking at that and different ways of interpreting it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, that's that's just the the story. Um, so once he'd renounced that vow. Uh, then he practiced and attained, eventually attained uh, full enlightenment or uh, arahantship. Uh, after he'd surpassed his teacher Ajahn Sao, he 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 spent the apparently he spent the rains retreat with him. And uh, during that rains retreat, because Ajahn Sao was senior to him, he spent the rains retreat doing all the services for his teacher. Uh, and then to, uh, after they'd been in there for a month or two, then he sort of very kind of gently kind of broke the news to him. Oh, by the way, <laughs> this is where I've got. And then after that time, then Ajahn Sao became his student. And, and then he led and eventually Ajahn Sao also became enlightened. While he was practicing, there's many, many stories. Uh, Ajahn Man's biography is around the place. So there's many stories of his practice in caves and his encounters with all kinds of beings and spirits and all of these kinds of things, which uh, you can uh, read in his biography. Um, one time he was visiting, staying in a monastery in Chiang Mai, and uh, while he was there, he was asked to become the abbot of the monastery. At that time, he was, apparently, they say here at that time, he was an anagami, a non-returner. And uh, he was asked to become the abbot of the monastery, and then he said, oh, I'm not going to waste my time here. And so he cr climbed out of the window in the middle of the night and ran back to the forest to stay in a cave and finish his work. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, very uh, very strong practice, very strong for his, his um, ascetic practices and his... Um, uh, dedication to seclusion. When I was in northern Thailand a number of years ago, I met a monk called Ajahn, another, another grumpy old monk called Ajahn Khan in Chiang Rai. And uh, Ajahn Khan had been practiced with Ajahn Man. And uh, so that, that generation, like when I was in Thailand in the 90s, that was really that time when there was the last few of Ajahn Man's direct disciples were still alive. The only one, or the only prominent one who's still alive now is Ajahn Mahabur. Um, Ajahn Khan said that he used to, when they were practicing in Chiang, around the Chiang Mai region, they also, there was like three or four of them, and they used to practice on hilltops, so on hi different hills. So they had a separate, each of the monks would stay on a separate hill. And every week on the, on the Uposita day, or on the Poya day, the small one, each week they would hold up a lantern so that they'd know that the other, and they could see, so that they'd know that the other ones were still alive. And then on the fortnight, on the Uposa today, they'd get together to do the Padimoka. Uh, and then the rest of the time they just spent staying by themselves and doing the meditation. So that was their lifestyle. Uh, after living in northern, northern Thailand uh, for several years, then Ajahn Man came back to northeast Thailand and uh, eventually settled down and, and uh, started a monastery. Uh, he... Um, it was kind of uh, interesting as to why he chose this particular village to start his monastery in. And uh, it was a pretty, very kind of poor, backwards village. The weather was really bad. The piece of land that the monastery was started on wasn't very good. And uh, there was, people really didn't, didn't understand why he sort of settled there, you know, places in the north of Thailand and that much more beautiful and much more um, sort of uh, better weather and all these kinds of things. But it seems that the reason why he stayed there was because, uh, or at least one, one theory, or one, suge one theory that I've heard of why he stayed there was because uh, in the local village was a woman meditator who was a very strong meditator, and he wanted to stay on and guide her. And if I have got my story right, 
And again, I haven't read this for a number of years, but if I got my story right, she was the lady later known as Meichi Gao, whose um, biography has just been translated into English. And uh, we've got a, I think we've got a soft copy of it at Santi. So if anyone's interested, uh, the story of Meichi Gao is around. But she evidently also became an arahant Ajahn Ma, uh, under Ajahn Man's guidance, a very talented meditation meditator. So uh, he stayed there at that time, uh, had got a very strong circle of uh, disciples. And that time, of course, the forest tradition was still very small. Um, and uh, uh, very much kind of marginal in Thai Buddhism, but uh, Ajahn Mahabua, uh, sorry, Ajahn Man had a had a, like a knack of of sort of gathering to him a small but extremely uh, sort of talented group of meditators, many of whom went on to become great meditation masters in their own right, uh, uh, and am among them were uh, Ajahn. Uh, Kao, Ajahn Mahabua, Ajahn Bua is another one, uh, Lumpur Te, uh, and, uh, and quite a few others. So probably the, the, the best known of his disciples from that period was Ajahn Mahabua, who spent about uh, a number of years, maybe five years or more with Ajahn Man, uh, and uh, has been his main interpreter. So the, the Ajahn Man that we see is largely Ajahn Man through Mah Ajahn Mahabur's eyes, and so that's important to remember in his biography. Um, other people have see a different side of him, and even though Ajahn Man has this reputation for being very tough and so on, but Ajahn Mahabur has got some very delightful stories of, say, a time when he was doing this ascetic practice where he would only accept the alms that, that was given to him in the village. Right. So remember, you'd go into the village, You'd get some sticky rice, a banana, maybe a, a you know a cookie or something like that, and you'd bring that back and you'd eat it. You, it wouldn't be very much, maybe a bit of chili or something. And uh, so I didn't, and he wouldn't accept any of the food that was cooked or prepared in the monastery. So only what was actually offered by the villagers. And this is similar to the practices that Mahakasapa would keep. So uh, no one would no one would actually allow to put any food in his bowl. Yeah except he said that, that uh, Ajahn, Man, Ajahn Man would would always find some way of uh, distracting him uh, and, and pulling away his attention and then sneaking something into his bowl while he wasn't looking. Yeah? So he used to always kind of do this to do that. So this is like another side to Ajahn Man that, that uh, you know, I don't think he was so stern and fierce all the time. Uh, so... So from this circle uh, of, of students of Ajahn Man, uh, many of them set up their own monasteries after Ajahn Man passed away. Uh, it was in, passed away, I can't remember the day, I think it was 1949 or nine, in the 1950s or something like that that he died. Uh, and many of his disciples then set up their own monasteries and became great teachers in their own right. One of the students of Ajahn Man was uh, Ajahn Chah, who's, the, of course, the founder of the lineage that I ordained in. And uh, Ajahn Chah's story was a little bit, or well, in some ways similar to, to that of Ajahn Man. He, he ordained originally in this village monastery near Uban Ratchatani, came from the same town as Ajahn Man. After a few years, uh, became interested in the, the forest lifestyle and the meditation lifestyle. He left that village, traveled around, stayed with different teachers, and learned a little bit from each teacher, although he didn't have, like, one main teacher who he studied and practiced with. Uh, Ajahn Chah went and stayed with Ajahn Mahabua, and there was one well-known occasion where he stayed for just a few days uh, when he was quite a young monk. And he always said that even though uh, he only spent a very short time with Ajahn Man, that, uh, that the, the, there was a really crucial time for him, that he answered some questions which were very, very critical for his meditation practice. One of the things that he asked him, because Ajahn Chah ordained in the Mahanikai tradition, one of the things he asked him is, you know, should I, I'd like to reordain as a Dhamma Yute monk. And Ajahn Man said, no, there's no need. Yeah? You, know, you stay in Mahanikai, and Mahanikai needs good monks as well. So this was kind of interesting, because there, it is a political thing between the Dhamma Yute and the Mahanikai. 
uh, as to which has power and influence and so on. And normally, if, if you was a Dhammayut teacher and there was obviously a very talented student who wants to come along and ordain, normally they'd be, oh, great, you know, it's terrific, come with us. Yeah? Uh, and so this is... Uh, see, sometimes, there's, there's, sometimes the Dhammayut goes so far as to, to suggest that the Mahanikai monks are not actually monks, right? So they say that the, the standards of Vinaya and the tradition were so bad that there's no authentic ordination lineage in the rest of Thailand. So, that, so this is sometimes suggested that actually only the Dhamma Yut Bhikkhus are actually ordained, the rest of us are novices. Yeah? And this is, this is taken quite seriously. If I, if, I, if I go and stay in Dhamma Yut monasteries, they won't let you in to recite the Padimokha together, for example. Um, so this, is, this kind of shows that Ajahn Man had a very different attitude towards this question. So some of the, t t I think at least two of the questions that Ajahn Chah asked Ajahn Man about, one was about Vinaya practice. And he said that he'd been, because he'd been studying Vinaya very carefully, Ajahn Chah did a lot of very, very deep, very detailed study of Vinaya and was very sincere about trying to practice everything as best he could. And he, 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 and he said, you know, basically he said to Ajahn Man, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he said basically it's just, it's just a headache, you know, you're trying to study, do all of these things. and. And you can never be sure of, you know, you've got everything right and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and so Ajahn Man uh, emphasized to him that uh, uh, at the base of it lies your intention. Yeah? And so we, we try to do the best we can in our study, in our practice. Uh, but uh, it's the intention underlying it which is the decisive factor in the end, not whether you've necessarily got every detail right. So this is getting a bit noisy, then you can come up closer if you want, if you can't hear. So the other uh, question which Ajahn Chah asked Ajahn Man, I'm just trying to remember it now, uh, but I'm a bit rusty, but he, uh, it was about, it was, a, it was a much more interesting question, it was about meditation and about the, uh, uh, how to use his mind in meditation. And I have to admit I've forgotten what the uh, exact question was. Maybe that will come to me later. Any case, so this was this encounter between Ajahn Man and Ajahn Chah. Uh, so later on, of course, Ajahn Chah set up his own monastery in Uban Ratchatani. So when he set up his monastery, just as Ajahn Man had reformed, had taken on some aspects of the Dhamma tradition and had criticized some and reformed some, uh, similarly, Ajahn Chah took up the, the Dhammayut forest tradition that he'd had experience with and reformed and changed certain things. The main thing that Ajahn Chah changed was he um, moved the emphasis back from the teacher, uh, from the guru, to the, to the sangha, to the community. Yeah? Now, in the, in the Dhammayut circles, we had evolved a very, very uh, kind of teacher-centric system or guru-centric system. So you had the very charismatic teachers like Ajahn Man, Ajahn Mahabua, Ajahn Kao and so on. And they would, a group of disciples would come around them, practice, and uh, usually when the teacher died, everything would fall apart. Yeah? And this is kind of pattern, and this has happened in just about every monastery. The teacher died, everything fell apart. And that things were too too dependent on the teacher. I mean, the the advantage of that. Um, so, for example, you see one characteristic: say, Ajahn Mahabua has a number of Western disciples, Western monks who are his disciples there, yeah? and they're all still there. Okay, and they ordained. Some of them ordained. The oldest one ordained, I think, in the nineteen sixties, right? And he died in the same monastery about three or four years ago. Okay, so they went there. Ajahn Mahabua said, "You don't go anywhere. You stay with me." Right? And they stayed there. And they didn't go anywhere. And the only place that they go to is to go down to Bangkok once a year to do their visa or something like that. And that's basically it. Uh, so that's Ajahn Mahabur's style. Yeah? Now, what that means, of course, is that you can support 
a close group of disciples yeah, uh, for many years, and so they had that stability and support and so on. But it also means that, well, none of you have heard of any of those monks. You haven't been taught by them, yeah? and we haven't had the benefit of the teachings from those monks. Why? Because they're still back there in their monastery there. Ajahn Chah had a very different approach, and he would very... he would. Uh, tell his young monks and young disciples to get, to get up on the, on the seat and give a Dhamma talk, even though they've been only ordained for a couple of years. Right? And so he would make them do that. He would make them go and start monasteries. He would make them leave where he was. He'd say, don't stay with me. You know, you don't get attached to your teacher. Go out and, and start your own place. And he uh, instigated a, a system of, um, I'm going to say a call what, or a, like a monastery um, protocol, and guidelines and so on, which could be implemented in different systems, like a bit like a franchise kind of system. Yeah, so you got this kind of thing in different places. So, and what that meant is that by supported by that system and by that protocol, it wasn't so dependent on a charismatic teacher. Yeah, so of course there've been some great meditation masters have come up through the Ajahn Chah tradition, but there are many many monasteries now. The Ajahn Chah tradition has well over 300 monasteries. Uh, well over a thousand, I mean even when I was there there was more than a thousand monks. Ajahn Chah has stop, was stopped teaching in the early 80s. Uh, he went into a coma for many years and he passed away in 1992. Uh, so he effectively hasn't been teaching since the early or mid 80s. Okay, So that's a long time and yet the Ajahn Chah tradition is still very strong. Okay, So there's still you know, I think there may be 2,000 monks or something like that in the Ajahn Chah tradition, maybe 500 Mechi, uh, and you know, certainly over two or 300 monasteries, as well as many branch monasteries overseas. How long was he in a coma? How long was he in a coma? Nearly 10 years, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I th I'm not exactly sure of all the details of the history, but I think he probably came in and out of it a bit in the earlier years and sort of, you know, more sort of slipped deeply into it in later times. Yeah. So, um, of course, there's various stories about that, you see, because um, uh, when, uh, when, um, when he was in the coma, he would be looked after. And, you know, when you're, when you're in a coma, you kind of, you're, you're never completely still. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody who's in a coma in the hospital, but they they usually they usually have some some kind of movement or something like that. They're kind of there's some slight bodily tremors or something like that, and uh, just like some if someone who's sleeping and then they kind of move from time to time or something. Uh, but Ajahn Chah would go completely still for periods of time. One time the the uh, <coughs> the king and the queen sent down a message. This was a really important monk to the local hospital. They sent down a message. It's a really important monk. You've got to look after him. So they sent this very kind of nervous uh, young nurse in there to look after him. And this, this male nurse who was looking after Ajahn Chah was like, you know, don't die on my shift, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so he did this kind of thing where he just went completely still. And uh, Ajahn Yana, who was a monk who was also attending there, and he said, oh, don't worry, he's just meditating. And so he, said he was starting to panic and he was like testing his, his you know, he wasn't br any, any breathing. There was nothing, no signs of life. It was completely still. Yeah. But his... Why? Because his body temperature didn't change. Yeah. And they, they literally couldn't test any breathing for several hours, yeah, except his, his blood oxygen level stayed the same. And, uh, and then he just sort of came out of, after a period of time. So there's obviously something going on there. And then, of course, there's many stories about this one story, for example. Um, well, this is a, a kind of interesting story that when he was in a coma, this, this, um, uh, uh, this lady who was a psychic uh, in Perth went to visit the monastery in Bodhnyana. And she, she arrived, she drove up there. She'd never been to a Buddhist monastery before. She arrived at the front gates and she parked outside the front gates and she wasn't sure whether she should go in. She was quite nervous about going in. And uh, this monk came to her and said, oh, you know, you know, so just, and just sort of waved her in and said, go, 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 go inside, this Thai monk. So she went inside the monastery and she went up and she, where it was where Ajahn Brahma and Ajahn Jagaro was and, and she said, oh, oh where's, where's, where's that nice monk who showed me in? She could see all the monks sitting there. Where's that nice monk who showed me into the monastery? 
I said, which monk? They say, she said, oh, it's, it's like this Thai monk or something. They said, no, we don't have any Thai monks staying here. And she saw a photo of Ajahn Chah on the shrine. She said, that's him. He was the one, he was the one who showed me in. Yeah. So he's still hanging around. And she said that, oh, yeah, he's, he, 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 he and the interesting thing was, she, she said he stays, yeah, he has a kuti over there. And she pointed to a part of the forest. And she said he stays over there in this little hut. Yeah. I don't know why he's staying in a little hut. But anyway, she said he stays in a little hut over there. But the interesting thing, which is just behind where the women's section now is, that was subsequently built there. And uh, sometime later, uh, a Thai monk who didn't know anything about this story visited, and he had also very good psychic powers, and he said the same thing. He said, Ajahn Chah's got a little kuti over in the forest and pointed to the same place and said, this is where he comes and stays just to look after everyone, make sure they're all okay. Yeah? So anyway, I'm just telling you the stories. So this is the... <laughs> Sorry? Oh, it's not clear that he, him and Arahant are dead. He was in, he's still in a coma then. He wasn't dead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's obviously, yeah. He, most people say he was an Arahant, yeah. yeah. He was not dead yet. He was in a coma. Yeah. Nietzsche? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. I don't know what could have been going on. But certainly, you know, they, you know, there's no, a lot of people in comas have normal brain activity. Yeah. So, uh, that's the Ajahn Chah tradition. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say about that? I'm not sure of the medical details about it. Yeah, it was just a kind of uh, a gradual degenerative process. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really know the medical details. Yeah. So, uh, Thai forest tradition. So, I should just to just to sort of wrap it up or bring it bring it up to date, I guess. But the the um, I mentioned before, just briefly in passing, that the the king and the queen of Thailand had sort of sent a message to the Ubon hospital. Now that's very characteristic of the, what had happened to, to the forest tradition. During the 1960s uh, and 70s, the, the Thai royal family started to take an interest in the forest tradition and started to visit them. And of course this caused a great shift in the whole perception of everything. So the forest monks, rather than being seen as these kind of semi-tramps, wearing these dirty robes, and living in these, you know, disgusting little huts in the middle of the primitive jungle, right? Oh, suddenly the king and queen are going there. What's going on, you know? And they started to, there started to be, word started to spread around in Bangkok society. Oh, these are arahats, okay? And then they started to realize, well, there's this kind of authenticity to practice. And they could sort of contrast that with what was going on with the city monks and so on. And uh, of course, you, then you you know you hear various kind of uh, uh, stories about you know what what happened when they when they went to visit like the um, Lumpur Chorp. Apparently, when when the uh, the uh, the Queen came to visit Lumpur Chorp for the first time, uh, she visited. They they chatted for a while, and then then he he she left. And uh, Lumpur Chorp was a very kind of simple kind of village kind of monk. He's very, very, you know, adept meditator, but a very simple man. And, and after he left, he said to the other monk who was there, he said, oh, she, that, she, she was a nice lady. Who was that? <laughs> and he said, I said, but that was, that was her royal majesty, because in Thai, they've got these incredibly highfalutin words for all the royal family, you see. So that was her, her, that was her royal majesty. He's like, what? Like, it was, it was, it was, it was her highness, the queen. What? What do you mean? Oh, it was, it was the king's old lady. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the king's missus. Oh, okay. And uh, so, yeah, all these kind of stories of how that happened. Apparently, another time when the the king and queen visited Lumpur Chorp, and again, I'm just repeating stories that I've heard. But apparently, that he used to do this thing with a small teapot and big teacups, right? So you sit round with a few people drinking tea and he was serving tea to the king and queen and they were chatting and they'd have fairly large cups and a very s small teapot and then he'd keep on refilling all the cups from the same teapot you see 
these are kind of little tricks that they have. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so it's actually it's actually like in the in the forest tradition, there's like one side of it is this this is very kind of austere thing and very uh, strict and so on. But another side is that there, there's a, there's a lot of very very colourful characters, very very playful, very uh, colourful stories and so on that they have, and uh, you know quite you know, wicked senses of humor and so on. And so they had this, you know, this way of being very, very uh, uh, direct and in their teaching sometimes. Just one, one example I can give you is, is uh, a man called Rumpu De, who was renowned as being perhaps the, the most um, grumpy of all the forest monks and also regarded as being a grumpy arahant. But he was one time giving a talk in this big, so it was the first time the forest tradition, Ajahn Lee had built this big sala in Wat Sokaram in near Bangkok. Big hall, and he was giving a Dhamma talk, and it was one of the first times when they actually had a PA, right? So they had a microphone and a PA and all these, and there's hundreds of people there chatting and chatting and, and making a big racket, and he gets on the Dhamma talk, and no, everyone ignores him, right? So he gets ready to give a talk, he's on the Dhamma seat, everyone ignores him. And he just looks around and no one's paying any attention or anything. So he gets the microphone, puts it under his lower robe and does a big fart. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this deathly silence through the whole place, yeah? Everything <laughs> just stops. He says, yeah, that's right. You listen to a monk fart, but you won't listen to him talk about Dhamma. That's it. And then he gets off and there's, it's his Dhamma talk, yeah. <laughs> So this is a forest tradition teaching, you know, and they always want to teach with very practical ways. Another one, Ajahn Lee, uh, one time was going to teach a retreat and uh, uh, met this group of lay people. They're all going to go out to the monastery to teach a retreat and he sees them and they've come and they've all got these big suitcases full of stuff. And he looks at it and he says, these people haven't come here to renounce anything. So they're at the train station. He just he just gets his bowl and robes and just starts walking down the train tracks. You know? And so they they just had to follow him. You know? He wasn't waiting for them, so they just had to pick up all their big suitcases and everything, and walk down the train lines. Yeah. And as they go on, they're getting exhausted and their hands getting sore and everything. And then they just start taking all this junk out and throwing it away. And they just threw out all their stuff out of their suitcases gradually. And when he saw that they'd thrown enough stuff away, he said, OK, that's all right. So then they caught the train the rest of the way. <laughs> so again, this is a forest tradition style. So these, after the, uh, the king and queen paid attention to them, the Bangkok elite started paying attention to them, then, of course, that's in a way that's the beginning or the beginning of the end, depending on how you want to see it. Yeah? And so, of course, these days, the forest tradition is very uh, relatively large in Thailand, uh, quite wealthy. They've got very big monasteries, so this becomes very political. See, in the old days, you'd go out to the jungle. The villagers would say, here you go, there's a bit of wilderness. You make a jungle, you make a monastery there. It's just forest. No one's interested in it. Yeah. Well, 50 years later, there's a city there. Yeah, there's suburbs all around, and that's valuable real estate. Yeah? So this becomes then a very political uh, um, uh, thing. So there's a possession of land. The status of the forest tradition, the way, the way that they're revered, then becomes a source of political tension, uh, and so on. So there's, it is, I mean, we don't want to go too much into the politics of it, but it, it does uh, have that dimension to it, which can't be ignored. But certainly it remains the case that uh, in Thailand, uh, the forest tradition is still very strong uh, and uh, still uh, a lot of uh, very wonderful forest monasteries. Everywhere you go, uh, you can find them. Uh, they're not the ones that are listed in the tourist brochures and so on, but the ones that you can stumble across by various kinds of means. and. Uh, you know, and in those places you'll see the monks sort of living a very simple life and practicing uh, meditation and so on. So it's still alive, even though it has uh, been through a lot of struggles and a lot of difficulties, but still here. According to your story, in the Thai forest traditions, there are two branches. The mana Mahanikai and the Dhamma Yut, yeah. That's in the Thai Sangha generally. And uh, Mahanikai. So Ajahn Chah was from the Mahanikai tradition. 
So you have this like formal distinction of you know the Dhamma Ute here and then the Mahanikaya here. Um, forest tradition is part of both of them. There was actually a proposal a few years ago. Ajahn Mahabua made the proposal to to form a third forest sect, yeah? because actually the forest monks in in the Dhamma Ute Mahanikaya probably have more in common with each other than they do with the the city monks in either sect. But that that um, that never got any traction. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they generally speaking, they tend to those circles tend to move around together, mix together quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're from the Dhamma Ute, and they're 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 from, they're, they're from the they're from the, the the main basis of the the, the the Thai monks in Sydney is from Watasokaram, which was started originally by Ajahn Lee, who was one of Ajahn Man's disciples. So that's, but Watasokaram itself is a, is a large monastery which is not far from Bangkok. So again, one of these places originally started as a forest monastery, but now has become it's not really a forest monastery these days, um, but still is kind of a, like a, the Bangkok centre for the Dhammayut forest tradition. Really, is at Watasokaram. So that the Thai monasteries in it. most of the, mon the Thai monasteries in Australia, certainly in Adelaide, Canberra, and Sydney, also Townsville, Darwin, and a few other places, as well as the ones in Indonesia, are uh, established from that circle. Whereas, for example, the, the monks in Malaysia are not. That's completely different. You mentioned that Ajahn Brown's example, he, he brought up Thai mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Thai, Thai Sangu is formally um, uh, administered by a body called the the Council of Elders, Mahatera Samakom. And, and they, that body is established under the Thai Sangha Act of 1962. Now, the Thai Sangha Act is a, is an act of parliament. The first Sangha Act was about 1901 or something like that. So it's actually like a a, 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 a formal kind of Western-style legal instrument that defines what is sangha and what is not, uh, and sets up a, a bureaucracy, an administration, a set of titles, uh, powers, responsibilities, and so on, uh, which is supposed to administer the sangha in Thailand. Um, one of the main agendas of the Sangha Act, of course, is to um, ensure that the Thai Sangha acts as a force for to support the Thai national interest. That's really the purpose of having the Thai Sangha Act. Uh, in 1962, for example, there was a <coughs> strong communist insurrection in a lot of parts of Thailand uh, and a, a military dictatorship in Bangkok. So the, the aim of the military government was to ensure that the, you didn't have like revolutionary monks who were out there supporting the... Um, the, the rebels. Okay, so this is kind of the political agenda that's driving that thing. Uh, the, the Sangha Act is fairly ineffectual; um, doesn't really do much. The Mahatera Samakom, the Council of Elders, most of them are pretty derelict. They're kind of they they they're in hospital a lot of the time. They, they barely functions as a as an operative body. Um, uh, so the administration is sort of handled more by the kind of mid-level administrative monks. Uh, and so this is one of the problems, is that even though the, t the, the, the social conditions under which the Thai Sangha Act was set up have changed dramatically. I mean, Thailand is not a military dictatorship anymore, or at least it's not this week. I don't know about next week. but uh, And the social conditions have changed a lot, but the Thai Sangha structure hasn't uh, followed that. Uh, because uh, just the attempt, it's the many attempts at reform, but none of them have worked. They haven't been able to find the unity and the leadership to be able to follow it through. Yeah. So they do have these titles. Ajahn Brahm was given a title. Usually the titles are things which, if you're in the administrative career path of a monk, is really coveted, it's really competitive, and you have to sort of work really hard and do a lot of stuff to actually get the title. Once you've got it, of course, there's a lot of privileges that come with it. In Ajahn Brahm's case, there was like a, a special king's birthday. I think it was like the king's 72nd birthday or something like that. And so he, he, they sort of gave a number of titles as like a special thing. And Ajahn Brahm was recommended by his preceptor, Somdet Puttajan, 
Uh, so, he, so even though he's not sort of formally part of the administrative structure or anything, but he was just sort of given the title as a special um, uh, like recognition of his, his work in, in establishing Buddhism overseas. Ajahn Sumedho is also a Jacqueline, yeah. yeah. He's also popular. Yeah, yeah. Um, not not formally, no. no. They did meet actually. Ajahn Chah and Ajahn and Mahasi met in, in England one time. Um, no, that, but it's 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 there's there's a similar. Um, I think there's a similar, uh, <clears throat> you know, origin. As I was saying, talking about the origins of the tradition, that, that it sort of came out of a kind of a modernist reform, yeah, rejecting the kind of traditional idea that you can't get enlightenment, uh, and coming back to an emphasis on meditation and specifically on on uh, the actual meditations that are taught in the Pali Canon, remembering that. A lot of what would have gone under the name of meditation in those countries, and which still does, but would would have been not something we would recognise particularly as meditation. It would be more like kind of mystical incantations, magical formulas, okay, attempts to get various kinds of psychic powers, ability to prophesize the future, all of these kinds of things. Yeah, so they, those kind of more kind of shamanic, magical things would be going on a lot. And the forest tradition was closely associated with that. Yeah, so the forest monks before our demands day was more like these kind of wild men of the woods, yeah, doing these kind of slightly kind of edgy, shamanic kind of stuff, yeah, maybe a bit of black magic thrown in the mix, you know, a bit like you know, a bit not not unlike the kind of the, the rishis and sadhus you get sometimes in India, yeah, uh, and so it was our demands tradition that we established that as a uh, on a linear basis, yeah. They, uh, the similarities would be that in, in, in what we would regard or call forest tradition these days in Thailand, Burma and Sri Lanka, uh, the, the, you know, they would all be similar in, in having a very strict approach to Vinaya uh, and emphasizing the core meditation practices uh, uh, and living in the forest, seclusion, those kinds of things. So in many ways very similar and typically uh, certainly as far as the Western monks are concerned, there's a lot of movement to and fro. So, you know, a lot of monks who I know are staying in Nawena or other forest monasteries in Sri Lanka or would go to Pao or can stay in the forest monasteries in, in Myanmar. Uh, so that's, and, you know, that happens all the time. But perhaps the main difference would be that the Sri Lankan and Burmese uh, forest traditions, uh, especially the Burmese and to a large degree, the Sri Lankan uh, have more uh, investment in the, the a kind of a, a strict Theravadan doctrinal orthodoxy. Yeah? Now, that's not important to the Thai forest tradition at all. So, in, but certainly in the Burmese and Pauk tradition, everything has to be right down the line according to the Pali commentaries and sub-commentaries. And he's very, very uh, learned in those things and follows every, every detail of that. Sri Lankan forest tradition, uh, depending on where you are, some monasteries are very much like that, others are a bit more I uh, independent thinking. But in the Thai forest tradition, uh, it's the Thai culture is very non-dogmatic culture, um, and they are very comfortable to reject things that are found in the commentaries or even to reject things that are found in the suttas. Ajahn Mahabur is quite happy to say, oh, no, this sutta must be wrong because I know from my experience. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so that they have, there's various teachings which they have in the Thai forest tradition, the most famous one being they talk about the, the, the original mind. Okay? So Ajahn Mahabur, Ajahn Mahabur talks about the original mind. It's not a concept you find in the Pali Canon. And so from a position of Theravadan orthodoxy, it's very questionable. Uh, but yeah, so there are things like that which you know you do find in the in the Thai tradition. Yeah. Uh, the kind of 